also thinking about it. I mean, for those who are football fans, Leicester was crowned this, this week. Amen? Leicester was crowned. An improbable story, if there was one. I remember a friend of mine who, on Facebook, at the start of the season, cheekily said, Leicester, don't get too comfortable because you'll be packing your bags for relegation at the end of the season. Amen? When we got to the end, someone cheekily reposted that message back and said, who, who said this, by the way? You know, humble pie, if there was one. But you see, for me, this is life. Because if you asked all the experts at the start of the season, can these people, should they even be dreaming about this? They will have said, be content with staying in the premiership, not even winning it. And these people did something that have never been done before because they believed in it. Amen? The same thing I believe God is saying to us today. We need to believe. Don't look at the opinions of others to determine whether God's word will do what it says to you. Amen? Embrace it in your heart. And let's believe that the Lord that has said it will bring it to pass. These people, they are no superstars. Amen? They're no superstars, but they worked as a team. Also tells us about the power of unity. Amen? Together, we are stronger. Amen. If there's a way the enemy tries to undermine us, he splits us apart. But there's power in unity. I pray that God will give us that grace, that as we press on in life, we will go bonded as one with Christ. Amen. And we'll get to our destination in the name of Jesus Christ. And the last one that came to mind as I was thinking about it was a few days ago when the London mayoral election was announced and the new mayor, um, Sadiq Khan, was, was announced. You know, I don't know about you, but his story is an inspirational story. Amen. It's a Muslim man, yes. But his story is an inspirational story. That it was a family of eight or nine now. Grew up in a council estate. The father was a bus driver. He's now mayor of one of the greatest, if not the greatest city in the whole world. There's nothing impossible, people of God. If people that do not have Christ can do these things, what's our excuse? So for me, I'm happy that he got there. Because why? It means we too will get there. Amen? Amen? I pray that there will be a time, and in our future, by the grace of God, it will be a reality, that those that rule this city, those that rule this nation, will be counted amongst us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want us to embrace that because, you see, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. If you had asked someone 10 years ago, will it be impossible for someone like so they can't to get there. They will have said, you know, it's not just bad that he's not from a particular background. He's Muslim as well. But he got there. Amen? Don't let your faith in God dampen your expectation as to where you can get to in life. Our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we could imagine or think. Amen? And I pray that God will strengthen us. God will encourage us. Students, I want you, even as you are thinking about your exams, as you are in the process of doing your exams, you're not just there to pass. You're there to excel. Amen? Passing should be a given. The key thing is whether you'll be first. Amen? If in a place of work, if you're in a business, we're not just there to survive. The Bible has given us a mandate. He said you dominate and subdue the earth. That is the call of God for our lives. I want us to look at ourselves, even today, and say, Father, I thank you for what you have done, but there's yet more on the inside of me. 
And God himself will press us to a new level of greatness in the name of Jesus Christ. Please, people of God, let us believe this thing. Let us believe this thing. They're not just mere platitudes that we just use to more or less quote our emotions every week. Amen? The power of life and death, they're in the tongue. Your self-talk is important. A lot of times we're defeated on the inside before it shows up on the outside. As they say, if there's no enemy within, then there's very little the enemy without can do. Someone said it well. It said, the most powerful weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Allow God to liberate your mind today. Allow God to fill your heart with new possibilities of what he can and will do in your life. In the name of Jesus Christ. With God, all things are possible. We're just going to our text today. In Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, it's a portion of the scripture we know very well. From verse 6 to 8, I'm reading from the KJV. It said, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Verse 8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part. Of the earth, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and therefore you'll be able to be a witness, not just at home but abroad. Amen. Not just at home, but also to the furthermost part of the earth. Let's look at another scripture before we go ahead, and it's a scripture Bishop Sam Kawaya used some weeks back when he he came to speak. In Ezekiel chapter 47, Ezekiel 47, from verse 1 to 5, verse 1 to 5. Afterwards, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters were issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood towards the east, and the waters came down from under, from the right side of the house, at the south side of the altar. Then he brought me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without, unto the altar gate by the way which looked eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. Then, and when the man that had the line in his hand, went forth eastward. He measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. Notice the measurements happened. Then he brought him through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Amen. First the ankle. Next to the knees. Amen. And he brought me, again, again he measured a thousand and brought me true. And the waters were to the loins. Afterwards, he measured a thousand. And it was a river that I could not pass over. For the water was risen. Water to swim in. A river that could not be passed over. Amen? So when Bishop Sam was explaining this, he was talking about progressive depths in our walk with God. That there comes a time in which, and the water represents the move of the spirit. That it gets to your ankle, then to your knee, then to your loin, 
And it comes a time, it is the waters that carries you. Because there's no power of your own that can withstand the force of that river. Amen? And for me, as I was thinking about it, I'm saying, God, how has my work been with you? Am I even in the river at all? Talk less of swimming in it. Am I at the stage in which it is more me, less you? And I want us to think about it this morning. And ask, Father, you have poured out this river upon us. You have spoken several words over us as a household. This month in particular, even as pastor was declaring, he said this month, it's about the evidence of the manifestation of God's power being realized in our lives. And I was thinking, Father, I need to walk that thousand cubits with you. Every phase of my life. Some of us, we've walked that 1,000 and that's where we've camped. Amen? So you've been a Christian 10, 20 years, but you're still on ankle level. Notice the man measured the cubit, then brought him along. Is it possible that God has measured that thousand for us, but we haven't embarked on that journey because we're still basking in the glory of the last thousand that we've just done? There are yet depths in God, people of God. What God has in mind, the fullness of what he has in mind for us can only be realized if we have sold out completely to him. Allow him to take us the entire route. Let's not stop at the ankle. Let's not stop at the knee. Let's not even stop at the loins. Let us wait until we are fully encased with that glory. If we're going to experience this power, if we're going to see our nation change, it will require Christians who swim at that level. The ankles will not do for the, for the battles we are faced with. The knees will not do for the amount of opposition we need to withstand. We need to empty ourselves completely of ourselves and walk that thousand with him. And walk that thousand with him. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're going to look at a few things just in line. I mean, the message, the title of my message, if you title it, is Pathway to Power. Pathway to Power. And the story is told about an American football coach, one of the old greats called Vince Lombardi, who did not like to lose a football game. He was the coach of one of the big football, American football teams in, in, in the U.S. But on a particular occasion, they lost a game, and it was a game they didn't want to lose. They didn't think they should have lost it, and lost it because they made some very, very silly mistakes as a result of that. It was recorded about this man, that he said very little on the bus away from the stadium, very little on the airplane back. But the next day at practice, when they, has, when they have assembled on the field, he reached into the canvas bag and had all the teams assemble around him. Then into the bag, he held up a football and said, gentlemen, he was talking to professional footballers now. He picked up the football and said, gentlemen, this is football. Then he started the drill with the basics. Amen? He started the drill with the basics. I believe this is what God would like to remind us of today. Some of those basics. Some of those basics in our Christian work. The book of Acts that like we read, when the Bible talks about the disciples that received power and turned the world upside down. These were people who focused on the basics, the fundamentals. It is the story of a church that was triumphant. But not so much of a big church. It was really the story of a group of unlettered, uncultured men and women with very limited resources. They had very little money. They had very little prestige. There was no college graduate amongst them. 
No seminary, no radio, no internet, no printing press. Amen? They didn't have massive church buildings. But yet, a group of these people went on to tell the story of a Jew that had been publicly executed. They went out against great obstacles, the imperial might of Rome, the intellectual sophistication of Greece, the religious bigotry of that day, and they turned that world upside down. When Adrian Rogers was talking about this, he said they did so much with so little. Is it possible that today we do so little with so much? Amen? Is it possible that we are not hitting the fullness of the investment that God has placed on the inside of us? Hallelujah. A lot has been spoken over us in the last few months, in the last few weeks. I believe very fervently in my heart that we are in an era of his power. Amen? For those of us who were at the FOL the previous week, the GO spoke about the right hand of God's power. And he blessed us as a people. God has been echoing the same message over us, talking about the expansion of the church. The glory returning to the church. So it's not so much of coming here this morning to tell you yet the same message. But rather to remind us that in order to see that power come to life, we need to revisit the basics. We need to revisit the basics. Oftentimes, the difference between getting to our destination or not are those basics, the fundamentals. And by the grace of God, we'll look at a few of them in the little time that we have. We have about five or so that we'll talk about today. And I pray that God will minister into our hearts, that we'll take this truth and go away and look at them with a new lens. Amen? The first one is that first of all, God has called us to a life of power and victorious living. That is the call that we have in God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again, Unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is incorruptible, that is undefiled, that does not fade and reserved in heaven for us. Amen? In other words, we were set out from the beginning to win. You know when you call someone to do a particular work and you don't provide them the means to achieve it, then you're setting them for failure. But if you have done everything that you possibly can, providing every tool, every equipment to be able to get to that destination, amen, you are entering into that race with an advantage. And when Christ talked about this. He said, we have been given an inheritance that is incorruptible, that is undefiled, and does not fade, and is reserved in heaven. You know when you are, you are sitting somewhere and, you know, you go to a particular place and, you know, there are more people than chairs. And you have certain seats that have been reserved. You know you can take your time. You know, you, you get there because why? That seat has been reserved for you. So it's not about how many people are there. Your name is on that seat. When the Bible talks about an inheritance that does not fade, he said in verse 4, it has been reserved in heaven for us. In other words, if we don't get there, it wasn't because the inheritance wasn't available. Because it was already reserved. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. So please be encouraged. This life that we are living in Christ, God wants us to be victorious. Christianity shouldn't be, ah, God, you know, we'll try it. Yes, there's a lot in it. But the Lord that started us on this race destined us to win the race. The story is told about the great preacher D.L. Moody. He was speaking to a large audience and he held up a glass and asked, how can I get air out of this glass? One man shouted, suck it out with a pump. Moody replied, but that will create a vacuum and shatter the glass in itself. After numerous suggestions, Moody smiled. Then he picked up a pitcher of water and filled the glass. He said, there, all the air is now removed. He then went on to explain that victory in the Christian life is not accomplished by sucking out a sin here or a sin there, but by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? But by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Every day, let the consciousness of God dominate your heart. Let the consciousness of his presence dominate your thoughts. That is the way to live a victorious Christian life. It's not about a litany of do's and don'ts. Christianity is first and foremost a relationship with God. Hallelujah. We pray that God will give us that grace. That every day we wake up to that reality. Lord, I want all of your presence in my life. When we begin to get into that level, to sin becomes a problem. Because why? You are conscious of his presence. There are certain things that it may not even be, as it were, sinful. In, strictly in the terms of interpreting the letter. But in your heart, you just say, because of the relationship I have with him, it's not helpful. And you abstain from it. That's where God is taking us. That's where he says you need to be if you're going to access this power. It is that level of work that goes beyond you're trying to impress one person or another. It's an audience of one. Amen? Your heart desire is to please him. Even if everybody is applauding you and in your heart you know that God is not happy, that's the only thing that matters. Amen? The consciousness of that presence. The second point we're going to look at is that there is a battle that we are involved in. And we need to get ourselves attuned to the mindset that we're in a battle. Amen? We're in a battle. We have to be prepared to endure. I was listening to <laughs> the general was a few days ago and he said life itself is a battle. Life itself is a battle. Humorously, he said, that's why a child comes into the world crying. <laughs> Amen? That you brought me in here into a fight. Hallelujah. Life is a battle. Someone said, you've either just come out of one trouble, you are in one, or you're about to enter another one. Amen? And what God is saying for us as Christians we need to be tough. We need to be tough. The Bible says in Matthew 11, it said the kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent do what? Take it by force. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty true God to the pulling down of strongholds and any high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 2 Timothy, verse 2, when Paul was encouraging this young man, he said to Timothy, he said, Thou should therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He said, No man that was entangles himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Yesterday, when we were having the minister's meeting, I think Pastor Tony was the one who was doing an exposition of this particular scripture. And we're thinking, endure hardness. 
as a good soldier of Christ. And she asked, she said, what are the sorts of words that come to mind when you read the scripture? And some of the ministers said, focus, determination, discipline, amen, a ruggedness, someone who is resilient, that anything the devil throws your way, you are able to come back because you've built in yourself a reservoir of strength that is able to withstand the battle. People of God, we're in a battle. We're in a battle. But you see, like we said earlier, the odds are stacked against us to win. But there's still a battle nonetheless. There's still a battle nonetheless. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 to 9. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion, walking about, seeking who he may devour, whom receive, resist steadfastly in the faith. I was thinking about that particular scripture. Resist steadfastly. In other words, the image I was just thinking about is, when it says resist, resist is not this. You're not carrying it away and they are, they are kind of just dumping stuff. Resist is you are, you are maintaining your ground. Amen? You are not only maintaining, you are also taking new ground in the process. So they come at you from here. By the time you are done, you are here. The enemy is coming at you and say, ah, you, you won't even pass university. Resist steadfastly. I have the mind of Christ. Not only will I pass... I will get a first. You are not only protecting your ground, you are taking new territory. He comes and assaults you and says, your health, you are not strong. Not only will you be healed, not only will you be strong, you will be a vessel that will minister healing unto others. That is resisting him and standing your ground. Amen? You know how it is when someone does something once, and you give it to them twice. That's, that's the mindset that comes to mind. It's not just about, you know, okay, thank God I withstood the devil. No. Root yourself in the word of God and begin to declare. It's not your fight, it's his fight. But what he said is, you stand in faith. You stand in faith. Amen? Someone asked C.S. Lewis. He said, why do the righteous suffer? Why not, he replied. They're the only ones who can take it. Amen? They're the only ones who can take it. Hallelujah. Amen. Helen Keller said it. She said, although the, word, the world is full of suffering, it is also full of overcoming it. No matter what you're going through, people have been through it and have succeeded, you too will succeed Amen. in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Most of the Psalms that we read and enjoy and take comfort, and I remember certain times I'm going through challenges that you're so burdened you can't pray. And at times I just play the Psalms because you feel David is kind of saying what's in your heart, but his words are better. I don't know if you've been in those kind of situations in which words fail you and you are, you are listening to someone say to say, uh -huh. you know, that, that's, that's how my heart feels. But you see, something about the Psalms is that most of the Psalms were born in difficulty. Most of their pieces were written in prisons. Most of the thoughts of the greatest thinkers of all time had to pass through fire. John Boyan, when he wrote The Pilgrim's Pro uh, Pro Progress, was writing it from jail. Florence Nightingale, the great woman who did so much for healthcare in the UK, was too ill to move out of her bed, yet she reorganized the hospitals of England. Semi-paralyzed and under the constant menace of apoplexy, Louis Pasteur was tireless in his attack on diseases. Amen? During the greater part of his life, the American historian Francis Parkman suffered so acutely, so acutely, that he could not walk for more than five minutes at a time. Yet, 
His eyesight were so wretched that he could only scrawl a few gigantic words on the manuscript. Yet, he contrived to write 20 magnificent volumes of history. Someone who could not write. You see, people, there's, there's a toughness that we need to have to face life. There is a toughness we need to allow God to instill in us to win in life. Because, you see, it's not just something we waltz into. It's a fight. So let the enemy know that I'm strong enough for this battle. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Amen? Sometimes, the man says, it seems that when God is about to make preeminent use of a man, he puts him through the fire. The fire... It's not meant to destroy. It's meant to refine. You are made of better stuff than to perish in the furnace of the affliction you are going through. God will give us the grace Amen. that out of every trial and tribulation, we not only come out, we come out better. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. On his wall in his bedroom, the great preacher Charles Spurgeon had a plaque with Isaiah 48 verse 10 on it. It reads, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. It is no mean feat to be chosen of God, he wrote. God's choice makes chosen men choice men. We are chosen, he says, not in the palace, but in the furnace. In the furnace, he said, beauty is murdered, fashion is destroyed. Strength is melted. Glory is consumed. Yet, here eternal love reveals its secrets and declares its choices. In other words, everything about us dies and everything about him comes to life. Amen? Amen. Whatever it is that we're going through, people of God, we will come through it Amen. by his grace and we'll come out stronger Amen. in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Being confident, Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this thing, that he that has begun a walk in you will perform it until the day of Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Point three, let us be bold and let us be confident. Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it day and night. For therein you will observe to do all that is written, and it will make you to be successful. The scripture says, just paraphrasing. Hallelujah. Let us be bold. Let us take, you know when in the, in the Old Testament there was this um, um, leader called Jephthah, and he said, when no one was going to help me, I took my life in my own hands, and I went out. Hallelujah. I think it was some weeks back when we were having the, the night vigil was, was Eniola who gave the testimony about, about the job and, and she said, I'm just going to launch out into the deep. Amen. And try and apply for this job anyway. Amen. And she got the job. She got the job. She cast the net out. A lot of times our nets are on the inside. Oswald Sanders says something which I like very much. He said, a great deal more failure is the result of an excess of caution than of bold experimentation of new ideas. The frontiers of the kingdom of God were never advanced by men and women of caution. Amen? The frontiers of the kingdom of God were never advanced by men and women of caution. Let's take the risk on God. As I was reading this, I was thinking to, I was thinking to myself, I was like, ah, God, I'm playing safe on too many things. I'm playing safe on too many things. Help me to launch out. Amen? Help me to launch out. Let me take new territories. You see, people of God... We need to do it now. 
we, we were talking to someone yesterday. We need to do, make certain decisions now. Why? Because there will come a time in the future that the decision will be yours to take again. Life is all about times and seasons. Life is all about times and seasons. There are certain decisions you need to make in your 20s. You can't be making them in your 50s. Why? Because you've run out of time. There are certain decisions you need to do in your 40s and your 50s. You can't be contemplating it in your 80s. Why? You've run out of time. Amen? Amen. But what hinders us is that we just try and play it safe. Play it safe. Play it safe. I remember a particular man I was listening to. A um, very successful entrepreneur from Nigeria. And he was, he was talking about the secret of his success. And he was talking to a sort of a younger generation. He said, guys, if there's something I'm going to leave you with. He said two things. One, have boldness. And two, have imagination. He said those were the two things. Because he said, I went to class with those who were just as smart, if not smarter than me. But some of them never amounted to anything. Why? Because there was no boldness to step out and follow their dreams. And there was no imagination. And when I said it to someone else, he said, what you said is actually true. Because my uncle, he was talking about his own uncle, went to the same class with this man. And he said, my uncle till tomorrow is still waking up at 5 and 6 o'clock to go to work. This man has multitudes of businesses. He doesn't need to work for the rest of his life. Why? Because there were certain decisions he made at a point in his life. Let's not kid ourselves. We don't have the rest of our lives. There are certain key things God has been saying to us that it's important we key in now and make that decision because we'll be living with the consequence of it for several years to come. Yes, God is the God of times and seasons. Yes, God is the one that can reverse and restore to us the lost years. Yes, but it has to be on a person who is prepared to take action. It has to be with someone who, follow your dreams. You're going through the same job day in, day out. You are miserable. You're unhappy. And yet you are talented in something else. But why? Because it has that sort of, you know, comfort. And it's cased you in that you can't launch out. Cast your net out. Cast your net out and launch out for your dream. Amen. People of God, we're not just talking about one small dream. This is the rest of your life here. This is your destiny. At least let's, let's give it a shot. If God is speaking to our hearts to say, yes, go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and do it. Like James 2, 17 to 18. He said, even so faith, if it has not worked, is dead. Being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Let your decisions show that you're a man or woman of faith. Let your speech, your utterance, demonstrate the fact that you're a man or a woman of faith. There are certain things that heaven has in mind for us, but we cannot access because we've not taken that step that would trigger heaven to release those resources. Let's do that. And God will help us even as we do that. In Jesus' precious name. Someone said this, which was quite humorous. He said, you can imagine the story of David. He said, you can imagine if Paul called um, Saul, King Saul called him. He said, the Philistines' army on one side, the Is Israel's army on the other side. King, King Saul has heard about David's bravery with the lion and, he, and the bear. So he calls for him. He says, son, we've got ourselves a situation. We need a champion to fight for us, and I think you are the man. So he takes David to a spot overlooking the valley. See our problem, he asks. And down the valley is a six-year-old girl, not Goliath now, a six-year-old girl challenging the army of Israel. Do you think David will need boldness to take that fight? Do you think so? Yeah? Of course not. You only need boldness 
from where there is a real risk. Amen? You only need boldness when there is a real risk. Hallelujah. God is looking for people with whom he can do the impossible. It is only a pity that we only plan the things we can do by ourselves. Hallelujah. And God will help us. Let's be bold. Let's be steadfast. Let's be consistent. And God himself will strengthen us as we do that. In Jesus' name. Amen. And the last one, sorry, I'm out of time, so we need to, we need to step through the remainder very quickly. It's about prayer and obedience to the word of God. James 1, 21 to 26. He said, wherefore, lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of nothingness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. But be ye doers of the word. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. And the next verse is something I've always thought about and pray that God, I pray that's not my reality. He said, for, he beho- for if any is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself and goes his way and straight away forgets what manner of man he is. So you stare at a mirror and you have an image of yourself and you turn away because If you don't do it, it just goes out. What this scripture is telling us is that not only must you glance at that mirror, you need to apply yourself to it. Unless when you turn away, that image recedes in your mind. But it's that image that you need to succeed. Let us make sure that our walk with God is also backed with a commitment to obey. A commitment to obey. A commitment to obey. I pray for grace every day. I say, Father, please help me. That your word is not too hard for me to follow. That I don't explain away your commandments in my life. As being something that I made suggestions. Open my heart to learn from you. Open my heart. Father, open my heart. So that, like, like, like the scripture says, that I might behold wondrous things out of your law. Thy word have I hidden in my heart, David said, that I might not sin against you. Let the word of God be of key importance. Let it have that pride of place in our heart. Every day, however it is that God is going to help you, whether it's 10 minutes, whether it's 15 minutes, start somewhere. But get into a place in which you get your mind attuned to the word of God. If you think you fall asleep when you are reading it, play it. You have audio Bible. Amen? Sometimes I, when, 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 when my mind is and I can't focus, I just play the scriptures. I just keep playing it over and over and over until my mind begins to pick it up. So try that. By any means, get the word on the inside. Because if you don't have that word on the inside, you can't fight. If you don't have the word on the inside, there's no image to do business with. Let God paint in your heart a picture of the future he's taking you to. And God will take you there. In Jesus' name. As we are doing business on the word, also our time and our fellowship with God is important. Someone was saying it, and I'll close with this. He said, why is our walk with God sometimes a crawl with God? Why the lack of passion for our Savior who gave his all for us? Why the lack of victory over sin in the average Christian's life? Why the lack of power to shake this world for Christ? The words of a preacher, Billy Sunday, rings true. He that is a stranger to prayer is a stranger to power. Amen? He that is a stranger to prayer is a stranger to power. Every day, let's go before God. 
every day. Let us ask him to coat us with his strength. Every day, we need grace to be able to do business for the day. We need grace. We need his word. We need his life in our hearts to be able to go and take territories. Hallelujah. And God will take us there. The pathway to power, people. These are some of the basics. I pray that God will give us that grace, that in hearing, in our going away today, we would reflect on some of these things and we would ask for that grace, not only to be reminded of them, but also to be obedient to them in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless us, even as we do that today, in Jesus' name. Shall we just bow down our heads to pray? Father, we thank you. Let's just, let's just bow down our heads to pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, Lord God, for your grace, O oh God, towards us. Thank you, Father, Lord God, for the opportunity, Lord, to, 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 to hear your word today. Like we said, it is you and you alone that can make the difference. Lord, as your people have heard t this morning, oh God, the grace, the grace, Lord, to obey. The grace, Father, Lord God, to make full proof of that which you have released over us today. Please give unto us in the name of Jesus. The letter kills, but it's the spirit that gives life. Father, Lord God, minister your life into every heart in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Also, make sure you add us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And visit the church website.